My name is Bill Kordemeyer. I grew up in Little Town of Chancellor, South Dakota, west of here. And I was a uh, reserve officer with a six-year total commitment of which only four had to be active, but it could be six. And I had a little girl that was born halfway through my tour in Vietnam, and I was anxious to get home and see her. But I wrote to my wife and said, I'm expecting, there's nobody in the pipeline to replace me. I'm fully expecting to be extended until they can find somebody. And so I got to go home on time, actually one week late. And I had prayed at the time, Lord, get me through all these rocket and mortar attacks at Da Nang Air Base. Just spare my life that I could get home so I could hold that little girl for one day. After that, I don't care, but he's given me a whole lot more than that because I'm 82 years old. Until Honor Flight, veterans like 80-year-old Leonard Loy had no chance to make it here. Too infirm for a 10-hour car or bus ride, not rich enough for a plane ticket, Loy would have lived out his days unable to see America's thank you. That is, until Earl Morse, a physician's assistant in Springfield, Ohio, asked Loy, one of his patients, a question. Way back in 2005, there was a physician that uh, was uh, caring for a World War II patient. And uh, the memorial had just opened up, the World War II memorial. And uh, the physician said, hey, you know, are you going to go out and see your memorial? And at the time, he was, you know, in his upper 80s and said, no, nah, I don't have the resources. And I can't get out myself there to go see that. And uh, that didn't sit well with the physician, who happened to also be a veteran himself. Um, and so he got 12 different little puddle jumpers together with some of his uh, pilot buddies. And they took a group of veterans out to Washington, D.C. And that was the first honor flight. Uh, having three great grandfathers myself that served during World War II and that never got the chance to go, it was my idea to just go and honor them through the through the experience. Um, then found out that there wasn't a group here in the area since 2012, and that you could actually start your own honor flight uh, chapter here locally. And uh, so the thought was one or two flights, and we would uh, honor some veterans and. Uh, something happened that first flight where we realized that there's more to honor flight than just simply flying veterans to their memorials. It's an opportunity for them to get some honor, respect, and some closure throughout the day, throughout the memorials, throughout the interactions with random strangers that they have, all while being welcomed home when they return. Thousands of demonstrators opposed to the Vietnam War assembled in the nation's capital for a mass protest. For the most part orderly, Minor scuffles did occur between the demonstrators and hecklers. But the first day when I arrived there, I rode a military vehicle to quarters off base, where I was going to stay over the weekend. And we went out the back gate and encountered a bunch of protesters spitting at us. They didn't throw eggs at that time. I think there was some tomatoes. But holding signs, you may be killing blank, blank, blank. And that hurt. I went into the, air, to the service, the Air Force, proud. But you are not proud when you were cautioned to not wear your uniform. <clears throat> I do not recall even my dad saying, welcome home. He did welcome me, but he never said it. I don't recall anybody said, many said, I'm glad you're home, I'm glad you're back, I'm glad you're safe. But nobody said, welcome home. My name is Ben Jans, I'm from Sioux Center, Iowa. And uh, I went into service in uh, 1960, uh, I'm sorry, 1970 in June. And that January, my number at the draft was 83. 
and I knew then and there that I would end up in Vietnam somehow. I just felt that. Uh, and then one of the missions when we were up north shooting some uh, tanks and so then my roommate and the, the pilot he was flying with and as we're shooting at some tanks and I went in with uh, my aircraft and uh, made my run and, and broke loose and we're coming back and then he was coming in on his run and all of a sudden um, I could see something wasn't wrong because he wasn't shooting any rockets or anything so I tried to get a hold of him on the radio but uh, there was no response and pretty soon the aircraft just turned upside down, went straight down, crashed and burned and exploded. And then I had lost my closest friend in Vietnam. But the, the thing, and I was still thinking of staying in even after that when I got back. However, then when I was in Fort Carson, another friend of mine who had uh, also just made it back about the same time as me from Vietnam, had survived all of that. And then he was taking a Cobra up from Colorado Springs up to uh, Denver. And on the way to Denver, his transmission froze. And then the aircraft went down and uh, exploded in the mountains uh, too. And I thought when that happened, uh, hey, I believe I had enough of this. One of the biggest things that we saw through the first honor flight was that these veterans are getting the chance to be honored. Uh, random strangers coming up and shaking their hands and uh, the big welcome reception when we get to Washington, D.C. Uh, surprise to them and, and for some of them just the faces that they make uh, not knowing all these things were coming and uh, their, their uh, shock to them and uh, people clapping and cheering for them. It's certainly something that uh, we definitely saw right away in the morning that this is something that this is going to make a difference in a lot of people's lives. In Washington, the treatment was unbelievable. We had Park Service, two Park, Park Service police cars, lights flashing, sirens blaring, escorting us, stopping traffic so we could get the buses, through, which is a big deal in Washington, D.C. At all the memorials, people ex running, exercising, stop and shake hands with us. Riding bikes, they stop and shake hands with us. It's just, the treatment was, was just out of this world. The SS Monterey arrives in New York Harbor with 6,500 members of the famed Timberwolf or 104th Division. These men fought from the beaches of Normandy to cross the Rhine at Remagen under the leadership of General Terry Allen. Our world War II veterans, they were celebrated as victors that saved the world. Uh, and so going to their memorial and seeing the, the massive fountains and the massive space there that showcases not only the war uh, and those efforts, but also the efforts here back home. Uh, then you go to Korea, known as the Forgotten War, and being able to see the stainless steel statues and, and those Korea War veterans being able to realize that there's a memorial that will forever be dedicated on our National Mall and that there is no longer such a thing as the Forgotten War. And then our Vietnam veterans getting to the wall and realizing that uh, their buddy's name is on that wall somewhere, or someone that they know, classmate, a brother, you know, someone that they knew well, and uh, being able to have that healing there have those emotions with the wall and just say goodbye for one of the, maybe the last times that they'll see that name written somewhere. It was especially touching uh, at the um, Vietnam Memorial there. Um, I, I did get both the etchings and so of my buddies uh, who had died in the crash, the helicopter crash in Vietnam and so. Emotional time, solemn time. Uh, even though you kind of know what to expect and so it's just so overwhelming uh, and so um, once once you leave there and get back on the plane then the next thing that's really sticks to you is about this mail call deal here I had a whole bag full I think I had 96 cards <laughs> in there and a lot of them were you know, my Sunday school members and stuff, and, and others, relatives and friends and everything. School kids uh, were there, uh, um, and you could tell from very young kids, write your little notes and, and something like that. The welcome home right in the airport's a big deal. You have the, uh, I can't think of it, the guys with the motorcycles and flags and so, right in Sioux Falls, uh, there and, and all lined up and uh, stuff. And uh, I, I made sure that I shook hands with every single one of them. Uh, for doing that. Then we came home 
tired, really tired. I was especially tired because I helped close up the night before, you know, and then at the airport at 3.30 a.m. <coughs> and we got on the buses, and they drove the buses in the big door, the back door of the arena. I did not know this was going to happen. Four big buses. I got off, saw my wife, my son, my daughter, and my daughter's mother-in-law. I saw eight or nine hundred people, a high school band playing patriotic music. The eight or nine hundred people waving signs and banners, welcome home and thank you for your service. And I dropped to my knees. And I cried. And my bus captain, I mean, I had a flashback. It's driving off at Norton Air Force Base, California, at the reception that I got there from, from the protesters. My bus captain came over and squeezed my shoulder and she said, Are you okay, Bill? And I said, Yeah, I'm more than okay, much more than okay. Thank you for taking part in this today and for taking me along. It was fantastic. Even though I'd seen all the memorials before, there was nothing like seeing them that day. <laughs>